We have talked a lot about Emmanuel this morning. The message of the cantata was entitled Messiah. I don't know why, but we tend to think that the child birthing process is such a natural thing. Because we have so many born every single day, in fact, there are 15,000 babies born every hour, we tend to forget the wonder surrounding the amazing event of a child being born. We look on it as commonplace, normal. And the sad to say, we tend to do that with the birth of Jesus too. But I want us for just a few moments this morning to think, to remind ourselves that the birth of Christ was not normal. It was not happenstance. It was far from normal, and it definitely was not an accident. This morning, our choir has sung about Jesus as the Messiah. Messiah, it was a Chaldean word which most believe the prophet Daniel appropriated and formed into Hebrew. It means anointed one. And it only shows up a few times in Scripture, twice in the Old Testament in the book of Daniel and twice in the New Testament in the book of John. The idea of anointing a person was that they were set aside for a specific task, for a specific calling. We have instances in Scripture that relay that prophets, priests, and kings were all anointed positions. It's interesting that Jesus fulfilled each of those offices, and that is why we call him the Messiah, the Anointed One. They were chosen by God to perform a particular task or lead a particular life. Probably the most memorable memorable anointing was when in the Old Testament, a man by the name of Samuel, who was the prophet, visited the house of Jesse. God had told him that he would find a king in this household. So one by one, from tallest to smallest, Jesse introduces each of his sons to Samuel, only to settle on the forgotten, youngest, ruddiest, Scripture says, the shepherd boy, David. Well, this boy, we don't know how old he was at the time, he knelt before the old man Samuel, God's appointed judge of Israel, as he poured out from a horned container oil. And from that day on, that boy who went back into the field and watched sheep for the rest of the day, having been anointed as king of Israel in the morning, goes out and watches sheep that afternoon, everyone knew that David would one day be the king of Israel. Ironically, Jesus never used the word Messiah to describe himself, but he was the chosen one. In the New Testament, it uses another word to further point that God appointed Jesus. That word is Christ. While most today would write it down as the equivalent of Jesus' last name, like Corey Minter, think Jesus Christ, or they would think Christ, Jesus Christ. That's not what it is at all. It's really a Greek title that says the exact same thing as Messiah. Anointed. Chosen. Promised. In our more modern and skeptical times, we, we don't really get the idea of anointing and prophecies, but it plays a key role in the birth of Jesus. Our choir has already sung about several prophecies that were fulfilled at Jesus' birth that proved that he was God's anointed one. He was God's Messiah for us. But I want to point out two specifically this morning. Firstly, Jesus would be born of a virgin. Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14, we've already read it in the narration, says, Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. That's not normal. There's nothing about Isaiah 7, 14 that is normal. In fact, it's very abnormal, but it's vital to the correct theology of Jesus, of who Christ was If Jesus were just the fruit of Joseph and Mary's relationship or any other erroneous suggestion of a human father, 
Jesus would not really be God's son. But scripture teaches that Jesus was holy human and holy man. Something that can only be understood through the virgin birth. It is essential to Christianity. And it was foretold 700 years before Jesus comes on the scene in Bethlehem. 700 years prior to his birth, it is foretold that a virgin shall conceive and have a child. That's the first, that he would be born of a virgin. The second is just as unbelievable. It was that Jesus would be born in Bethlehem. That seems a bit more tame, maybe. But Micah 5, 2 tells us, But you, Bethlehem Ephrathah, though you are little among the thousands of Judah, out, yet out of you shall come forth to me the one to be ruler in Israel, whose goings forth are from old, from everlasting. Moms, you, you can make the appointment with the, doc, with the doctor to induce you at a certain time and a certain place. But there is no guarantee that your child would come on that date and in that hospital room. Some of you could testify to that. But about 700 years before Jesus was born, with about six major empire upheavals between, the prophet Micah prophesied that Jesus would be born in Bethlehem. Think of it this way. Of the globe's 197 million square miles God relayed that his son would be born within the tiny four square miles of Bethlehem's ancient city limits. It's as if God brings a telescope down and focuses on one particular place. But there's a problem. You remember, Mary and Joseph, they didn't live in Bethlehem. Sometimes we forget that. They lived in Nazareth. And honestly, if God had even gotten it close, within 100 square miles, I'd be pretty impressed. Of the 197 million square miles in the world, he got it down to 100 square miles, I'd be impressed. But at a last minute, late in the pregnancy decree by Caesar Augustus, made sure that the couple traveled from Nazareth to that four square mile plot of land that had been prophesied 700 years earlier, there the Messiah will be born. Maybe that's why Jesus never referred to himself as the Messiah. He would let his fulfilled prophecies speak for themselves that he was the Christ. He's the son of the living God. It is definite. Jesus' birth was no accident. It had been ordained before the foundation of the world. And his death wasn't an accident either. No one can choose the place and time and method that he will die. We may think that we can, but we're not given even a sure thing there. But God delivered prophecies to his people to make sure that we knew he had chosen this for his son. Dozens of prophecies fulfilled in the crucifixion of Jesus. Again, the prophet Isaiah, he helps us. Let me read a large portion of Isaiah chapter 53. Surely he, Christ, has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace was upon him. And by his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We've turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He was led as a lamb to the slaughter and as a sheep before its shears is silent. So he opened not his mouth. He was taken from prison and from judgment. And who will declare his generation? For he was cut off from the land of the living. For the transgressions of my people, he was stricken. And they made his grave with the wicked, but with the rich at his death. Because he had done no violence, nor was any deceit in his mouth. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He has put him to grief. When you make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed. He shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. He shall see the labor of his soul and be satisfied. 
by his knowledge, my righteous servant shall justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. All of that written seven centuries before Christ would be crucified. It would be as if long before America had been birthed in 1776, somebody would say that there would be a boy born in Norfolk General Hospital in 1986 to Mike and Pam Minter, and that's astounding, even more so foretold of his death. All written 700 years prior, before Jesus was arrested, beaten, crucified, buried in a borrowed tomb. His death was no accident. It did not catch God nor Christ himself off guard. But the most striking aspect of Jesus being the Messiah, the Christ, the anointed chosen one, it comes only one time. The only time that Jesus even refers to himself as the Christ I mentioned earlier, he doesn't ever call himself the Messiah, but he does once call himself the Christ. And it's the night before he is to be crucified. And he prays. He prays a chapter-long prayer. And he prays to the glory of the Father. He prays for his disciples. And friend, I want you to know something. He prays for you. Scripture records that he does not pray for his, those 12 only, but also for those who would come after them. Corey Minter's name is among that list that Jesus prayed for the night before he was crucified. He prays for you. Which promises me this. You are no accident. Christ's death nor his birth was an accident, and neither are you. Listen in on this intimate prayer conversation between Father and Son. God the Father, God the Son, in John chapter 17, verse 1. Jesus spoke these words. He lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Like the 197 million square miles around the globe and God focused in on those four square miles in Bethlehem of the millions and billions and trillions of hours that have ever been spent in history, the hour had come. And his prayer is this, glorify your son so that your son may glorify you as you have given him authority over all flesh that he should give eternal life to as many as you have given him. And this is eternal life that you may know the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. Friend, his birth was no accident. His death did not catch him off guard. And I want you to know, without a shadow of a doubt, this Christmas season, you are no accident. You have been purchased at a great price by the almighty creator, sustainer, redeemer of the universe. He is your Messiah. He is God with you, Emmanuel. He's the prince of peace for you. In a world that tries to push the narrative that humanity itself is just some cosmic accident of evolution, know this. You are not an accident. Jesus came, he lived, he was crucified, he was buried, he resurrected, and he ascended that his father may receive the glory of winning you back to himself. You are an incredible gift purchased at a very costly price. Do not waste this Christmas. Give your life to him wholly and completely as he has his life for you. 